Uh, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, our webcast here, our webinar. We're going to be talking today with one of our customers, uh, one of Duncan Parnell's customers uh, that has recently installed their first Trimble monitoring system. And it's the, the goal is to really uh, highlight some of the uh, challenges, best practices, things like that, that this customer, uh, Draper Aiden and Associates, has learned during the course of implementing the system. Um, my name is Joe Priesner. I'm with Duncan Parnell. I manage the technology group here that's focused on some of these um, technologies, some of these uh, products that require a little more support and knowledge. Um, and we help our customers get up to speed with this stuff as, as quickly as possible. Uh, I've been with Duncan Parnell now for about 10 months, but uh, prior to that, I was in consulting, doing monitoring projects, large-scale monitoring projects since about 2009. Um, I'm joined today by Roland um, and Cheryl. Roland's from Trimble, and, and then Cheryl is from Draper Aiden Associates. He was the, the one responsible for setting this up. Uh, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Perfect. Um, hey everybody, my name is Roland Chen. I'm uh, the monitoring sales manager for the Americas, or one of two of them. Um, so I'll be here to just kind of walk us through a little bit of the Trimble portfolio, so that way we can all be speaking the same language uh, and just you know answer questions as they uh, come up. Yeah, I'm Cheryl. Um, sure. I'm Cheryl Stockton, a survey team leader for Draper Aiden Associates here in Charlottesville. Uh, had been working with ANSCA on a couple other projects, uh, one at James Madison University, and uh, more recently one at UVA Hospital Expansion. It's a multi-story addition to the hospital here in Charlottesville, and it's the largest construction project that the university has ever done. And as that project was wrapping up, uh, Skanska was awarded the Alderman Library Expansion Project and got us on board to do the survey construction stakeout. And then a, a couple of months later, uh, Skanska asked us if we'd be interested in doing the monitoring as well. And you know, we said we were definitely interested in it, but it was clear that we didn't have all the expertise to do it. So we uh, asked uh, Rich Lindenberg with uh, Wish and Elsner to uh, team with us. He's a structural engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rich was also, uh, he was actually the one who suggested that we use ATSs for this. Uh, it wasn't in the project specs, but he came up with a plan. And um, we presented that to Skanska and to UVA and they liked it and they awarded the monitoring program to us. That's cool. Yeah. Um, now the format for today is um, we're, we're testing this out, trying it out for the first time here. Is we're going to first talk about Roland's going to talk about the uh, the Trimble monitoring ecosphere for about ten minutes, just give you an overview of all the uh, products and kind of how they go together. Um, and then Cheryl's going to talk a little bit about the uh, project. We'll show some images from the project. Uh, just a few slides uh, of the setup and what the project looks like. And then we're just going to do a roundtable discussion uh, between the three of us. I think Riley might chip in. Riley from Trimble's on, uh, he's online too. And um, then we're just going to talk about some of the, the challenges and things like that. Uh, and feel free, anybody that has any questions, you can enter a question there. We have somebody monitoring, Marissa, one of our marketing specialists is monitoring the, um, the questions. So she will uh, chime those in as we're going. Um, so Roman, why don't you take it away and show us the Trimble monitoring portfolio? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we'll just start and go over, again, all of the offerings that we have and kind of different technology and software solutions that we have so you guys know what we're talking about. Um, otherwise, when we're talking about total stations and software and stuff during the roundtable and things like that, it might be a little confusing. So to get everybody on the same page, we'll just start there. Um, Trimble monitoring is really all about automated movement detection with confidence. And so it's about more than just taking data in the field and, and delivering it to whoever needs it. It's really about 
taking the data and making it useful so that you can make those informed decisions about your site. Because one thing to, to change an Excel sheet with, um, you know, displacements and numbers and stuff on there, it's a totally different thing to get those automated alarms and those in-depth uh, charting and analysis options and reports and everything like that. So it's really designed to make it easier to manage a site that's got things in motion and complicated uh, um, movement going on. Uh, Trimble monitoring as a whole has been around for more than 20 years. Uh, we've done thousands of installations across the globe, ranging from just a few sensors with you know a single total station and prisms, up to a few thousand sensors with total station and GNSS and geotech and everything integrated in there. Um, on the same lines, we have sites that run for anywhere from a few months to 15 plus years. So the the system is really supposed to be as deployable and um, um, kind of customizable as you need it to be. Uh, we also have hundreds of distribution partners across the country uh, serving our customers, doing uh, local support service, as Joe said, a lot of different consulting work and being that, uh, if you need it, uh, a local resource for all the knowledge and things that you would need. Uh, we offer everything from that semi-automated to that fully automated system. So as, as we like to say, from the tripod to the pillar installation. Um, so the semi-automated being focused on that traditional manual workflow, uh, but it really just automating those workflows. So if uh, somebody's going to site with a total station or a GNSS rover or geotech equipment, uh, and they're taking those measurements manually. We're really working to make it easier to do that so it frees somebody up on site to go do other things. Um, so with the total station and data collector, it's got a, a module on there that will run uh, and run the rounds for you. So you can set your total station up, collect your data collector, run rounds you know, all day long, and then tear your stuff down, go home, come back two weeks later, set it up and do the same thing. Um, and then we also have that fully automated setup. So when you set your total station up in the field permanently to run 24-7, uh, either because you have a higher risk structure that needs you know higher frequency data on it, uh, or if you're operating for a long time, it just makes more sense to set it up permanently so you don't have to keep going back to the field. Uh, we really have a solution kind of dedicated to each of those uh, workflows. Uh, today we're focused most on automated monitoring, so we'll do kind of that highlight for the uh, portfolio. There are really uh, three main components to an automated system. Uh, one, obviously, is your sensors in the field. Uh, and with the automated system, there's a lot more flexibility with the actual sensors that you're using. Um, so you can use anything from the standard total station and prisms, um, GNSS systems, and uh, adding geotech and weather stations to that mix. Um, so really combining all sorts of different data types. Uh, everything in the field is going to need power and communications. Uh, anybody who set up a system knows that that's a key component. Um, and then along with that, we have the uh, software package called Trimble 40 Control or T40. And that's split into two sections. So there's T40 Control Server, which runs as the back end that does all the data collection and data processing. And then the front end, which is called T40 Web or, or Trimble 40 Web, that's really the, um, it's what users and customers are going to interact with. It's the, the tool we have for visualization and reporting and alarming. Uh, really anything that's going to be um, uh, that data visualization. Uh, for sensors, I'm going to go through that quickly. We use the Trimble S series for the total station. Uh, the S series comes in all sorts of different flavors. Uh, the workhorse is the S7. Um, that's going to be kind of the all-inclusive total station. It's going to be available in um, uh, robotic and auto-lock flavors. So if you're going to do some robotic surveying, you can use it and deploy it uh, in multiple places. Uh, it's really good for general surveying. It's also really good for monitoring. It's just it's just kind of the standard deployment for total station. Uh, we also have available the uh, S9, which is speckable with a, a lot more options. Um, so it's really similar to the S7, but you can get it in higher accuracy EDM and higher accuracy angle uh, angular specs. And you can also get it with uh, long range fine locks. So if you have some more specialty applications that require higher accuracy or longer range, you're going to want to go with something like the S9. Uh, and then we also have the S5 TIM, which is uh, the scaled back version that's totally dedicated to monitoring. Um, we don't deploy these as often, but it is available. So if you need it, you can get something dedicated to monitoring. You're going to set up uh, maybe in a rough environment that's going to run for a bunch of years and you're not planning to deploy it anywhere else. The S5 is a good option for that. The total stations uh, are extremely reliable and durable. And so they are IP65 rated and use a frictionless magnetic drive system. So they're super, imper super impervious to things like moisture and dust. And so it just lets you set it up in the field and know that it's going to keep running and it's totally designed to be out there 24 seven. You don't have to worry about, you know, if it rains, you're going to have to get a new total station or something like that. It's really designed to give you that confidence you need to install it and run it all the time. Um, they're also super interchangeable. So if you have, uh, maybe your total station needs to be calibrated because it's been out there for a bunch of years. You're, you're more than free to take it off of the, the tribe rack and then put a, total, a different total station back on and just do a hot swap and keep running, get the other instrument repaired or calibrated, and then put it back out in the field. Um, 
And the S series is also a standard uh, uh, survey total station, so it's really easy to deploy a total station from uh, if you're you know a surveyor and you have a few at your hands, you can take one out of your fleet, put it in the field, and have it run for a bunch of years, and then take it off and put it back in your fleet and use it for surveying applications. Um, most total stations are also speckable with Trimble Vision, so you can have a camera in your total station that just makes it a lot easier to manage your site. You can do things like add targets remotely or just check the status of the site without having to go there. Um, monitoring sites can a lot of times be a few hours away from your office or where you live. And so if you're doing something simple like adding targets, it can save you a whole days of travel just to get out there. So you just open, open the instrument uh, at the targets, it takes 10 minutes and you close it and go about your day. So instead of having to drive that three hours in site and three hours back, you can just do it during your lunch break. Um, it's also got a fine lock and auto lock technology, which is really good for target separation. So if you're doing like a, a rail or a road or a bridge or a tunnel or even a tight construction site where there's a lot of prisms and there's space close together, having that fine lock can be a key, uh, a key feature for the total station. We also have a uh, GNSS uh, offerings. Uh, as you guys know, Trimble makes a lot of GNSS. Uh, we have everything from survey rovers to base stations and everything in between. Um, GNSS monitoring is great for either high interval monitoring where you need to take data you know, at 20 Hertz instead of every few minutes. Um, so collecting data from a GNSS receiver is a great way to do that. It's also good for, for widespread settlement and, and, and regional monitoring. So a total station you know, has a range of you know, 1,000 meters, 2,000 meters. Uh, but a GNSS antenna can cover an area um, of, um, you know, a city or a state or a county or something huge. Um, T40 is also really good at GNSS processing. And so having that GNSS in there and doing a combination of real time and post processing, they get those rapid alerts and those high accuracy results. Uh, it's all super customizable and really easy to set up. Um, it's also super flexible. And so you can use uh, your base stations or your, your monitoring stations. Um, as one or the other. So if you have surveyors on site, they can connect with their rovers and do uh, RTK or VRS corrections from the uh, receivers directly. And then you, you have a, a multi-purpose receiver all of a sudden. It's not just dedicated to monitoring and it's not just dedicated to being a site base station, but you can use it for both applications. Uh, we also have all the accessories uh, that you would need to turn your total station or GNSS or, or geotech equipment into a uh, fully automated system. So things like prisms and um, houses and mounts and things like that. Uh, we're really a, a one-stop shop for everything you would need for, for monitoring. Um, we have all different flavors of prisms. So depending on your needs, if you're doing your standard job where you just want to set up you know, 50 prisms all in L brackets, we have those. Your long range prisms, your integrated GNSS and your specialty prisms, uh, pretty much everything is available. Uh, the mounted enclosures as well. And so we have high security or high protection options for your total station mounts. We can do wall mounts and pillar mounts. Uh, so any installation you have, we can we can work with it, uh, as well as cabinets either for the setup M1, which is a field controller that we use for the total stations, um, and one that is large enough to house both the M1 and your GNSS installation. So if you have both on the site, you can put both in the same housing and just uh, uh, simplify the the power and housing solution that way. Uh, in addition to kind of that standard geospatial portfolio, we have now uh, geotechnical sensors. Now, I won't go into too much detail on here because the world of geotech is uh, deep and immersive, and we could spend hours talking about that on its own. Uh, but basically, how it works is we have uh, geotechnical sensors, whether they're going to be uh, um, data loggers that are connected to something like a piezometer or a vibrating wire uh, sensor, an extensometer, a crack meter, or something like that. Uh, they'll take data automatically from those sensors uh, and send it via long range radio to the gateway. Uh, in addition, we have uh, uh, laser distance meters and uh, tilt meters that can measure uh, convergence and tilt on structures. Um, all the sensors communicate with long range radio back to the gateway. So the, the deployment is, is extremely flexible. We can have your gateway up to 15 kilometers away from your sensors. So you can have this at like a, a, a site office or an office down the street from your actual uh, construction site or monitoring site and everything's gonna communicate and come in no problem. Uh, transfer the transfers the data via API into T40 Web, and so you get all the the standard features of T40 Web with your data visualization, reporting, and alarming, uh, with your geotech sensors, and if you're using it with all your sensors in one place, so your total station, your GNSS, and your geotech. Uh, T40 is the software that kind of brings everything together, so it's really meant to make uh, managing the site that much easier. Uh, there's a lot of different visualization tools and reporting tools that you can use in there. So whether you're doing a simple uh, chart or you're doing a heat map. Uh, or um, 
uh, or a scatter plot or anything like that. It's really made to to give you the tools that you need to show show the site the the health and the status of your site. Um, so it's really easy to use a sensor management and data integration portfolio. Uh, there's a really powerful backend that does the geodetic processing and adjustments for your uh, total station in GNSS. And there's all the visualization and reporting tools. So it makes it really easy to come in and see exactly where displacements are at if you're using the heat map. You can make uh, charts and uh, visualization tools that combine multiple data sets. So if you have your geotech or your GNSS in combined or in combination with your total station, uh, you can pull all that data in one place and show it as one coherent data set. There's also the uh, conditional alarming and reporting. So the same idea being you have a, a way to kind of cross-validate data. And so if you're doing, for example, a rail project and you have combination of tilt meters on the ties and prisms on the rails itself, you can have charts and reports and alarms that show that data in combination. And so you can also have a self-validating alarm that has to check, you know, the tilt has moved this much and the prism has moved this much. And so now the alarm is real and it, it triggers and alerts everybody on site. Um, so it's really designed to be as, as simple or as uh, in-depth as you need it to be, depending on your project requirements. Um, T4D, one of the most powerful uh, aspects of it now is that it can integrate all three data types. And so whether you're doing a project with just Total Station or a project with just Geotech, uh, or if you're doing one with a combination of all different three, uh, three different data types, uh, it can bring it all together and use them uh, kind of as needed. Perfect. And that is my overview. Um, do we have any questions come in? It's uh, hopefully pretty straightforward. So far, no questions. Sure. Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you do want to ask Joe, Roland, or Cheryl questions, use the questions pane in the GoToWebinar panel, and you can type it in there, and they will answer them as we go. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Roland. Um, why don't you go ahead, let's see, let me share my screen now. And you see my presentation yet? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right, Cheryl, why don't you take it away and we'll uh, talk about the project, what it actually was, what, what you were doing out there. Sure. The uh, Alderman Library uh, was first constructed in the 1930s. And the shape of the project is like a horseshoe. And there was a later edition in uh, 1970, and that edition filled in that horseshoe area, and that's where they stored the the, st the stacks and the books there. And the architecture wasn't really the best place to store those books, and uh, it also wasn't consistent with the um, um, with the original design, you know, the original design uh, in the 1930s uh, with the arched windows and the columns, uh, a really beautiful structure. And uh, the addition just wasn't in keeping with that. So what the university wanted to do was uh, basically make better use of that space. And uh, so now they're uh, building a state-of-the-art uh, library edition where the old stacks were. And so part of the challenge of that is that um, you know we have to tie to the we have to tie to the existing uh, structure and the courtyard is a very sensitive area of of that um, structure and um, the wings um, have total stations installed in all of those what you're um, what you're seeing here is uh, basically the the building is being demol has been demolished or partially demolished, and you're seeing the the wing over there on one side. And um, so they're do, they've done demo and are also underpinning all the uh, new foundations for the building. So the the new structure is going where the old structure was, and also uh, being expanded and making a larger footprint of the library. Yeah. yeah. And this is where, this is what the mount looks like. We've got two instruments out there. Mm -hmm. um, 
one on this this uh, mount here, and there's one directly across from it. Uh, I think the decision to, to mount the instrument on the building was just driven by the all the points that we had to see in trying to get sight lines to them while they were actually building the foundation and building the foundation of the new addition here, a new uh, part of the building. Um, I like how they wrote, do not lean on this thing on the uh, mount there. It's important. Resting against it. Um, but it, it was actually, these both of these are very stable. Um, it worked out really well. Um, Is there any monitoring done during that um, during my structures in the way? Was there else done? was not. The original plan was to uh, have you know, everything installed before there was any demo whatsoever, but uh, that isn't how the project uh, progressed. Right. So like a lot of construction projects that it's right. a it's a changing environment. Uh, you, you don't really know what's happening until it's it's there. So uh, in some ways it wasn't it wasn't ideal because we didn't have any baseline measurements going into this. Uh, and so after after the demo was done, um, that's when we started uh, installation of these targets. And uh, Skanska actually uh, installed uh, the majority of, of the sensors on site. That's right. So Skanska put most of the prisms up. And the Skanska put most of the prisms up. And the up. Yes, they did. And I just put this this image in here just because it's typical construction site. Just we're we're working on one instrument, and they're all of a sudden they cut this hole in the plastic and start flying steel in like three feet from another instrument. Oh my god! Uh, just typical uh, setup. That's really, uh, you know, the project and the images I had. So now it's um, a feedback on your side, I think. There'll be an echo or something. Yeah, is that on Cheryl's side? Yeah, I'm not sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, the, um, so that's all the images I had of the project just to show. Um, and I can stop sharing my screen. I could figure that out. <laughs> That's the biggest. There we go. There we go. Uh, so the rest is really just to kind of interview and talking to, with Cheryl and just discussing our combined experience. Um, now, Cheryl, you said you were brought into this project just because you were uh, you guys were out there. You had a relationship with Skanska. You were already on site surveying, and then you brought in a partner to. Uh, to help with some of the other geotechnical type instruments, um, settlement and vibration, I think. Um, was there a monitoring, were you given a monitoring plan, uh, kind of describing where the instruments should go or the prism should go and things like that, or did you guys have to develop that on the fly? Uh, Cheryl, you're uh, muted now if you're trying to, to talk. Cheryl, you're uh, muted now if you're trying to talk. Unmuted. Yeah, the um, the specs did not call for um, ATSs to be used on this, and our teaming partner, um, Rich Lindenberg with WJE, is the one who recommended that. Mm -hmm. He just felt that the absolute mm -hmm. um, values of the ATS gave you better results and were more easily interpreted. Uh, so Rich did a lot of the... Um, the planning for this, but uh, I found myself in a position where I was also having to prepare uh, project specs. Um, basically, uh, how how are we supposed to? How is the contractor supposed to install a, a survey monument? How are the things going to be? How are the um, stations going to be constructed for the prisms, uh, the fixed prisms, and uh, how are the um, um, targets going to be installed and where are they going to be installed? Uh, Rich had a, a plan of kind of a 2D plan of where they're installed and uh, we had to draft a, a 3D version of, you know, where where is that going to be actually in space um, and use the project plans. So the, the 
when it was all said and done, I, I think that we had like over a hundred pages of specifications that we had to prepare um, for this project. And that's the first time I'd ever done anything like that. So that was, uh, it was a daunting task. Now, did they, did they provide a schedule like uh, sequencing or anything to you uh, to help you plan sight lines in your instrument position or anything? Or how did you come up with those instrument locations? Uh, I worked with uh, Rich to uh, come up with a, a plan for the instrument locations. Uh, so that was uh, something that we developed ourselves. Uh, the, the design team basically just waited for us to submit things and they uh, offered us very little feedback. Uh, just, just, yes, you can do this or no, you can't. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that kind of took us off guard was that they uh, they said that uh, all the sensors um, or almost all the sensors would have to be attached to seal. So uh, Rich had to come up with a plan for you know not just uh, not just uh, screwing the prisms into uh, mortar, but um, how to how to tap into the steel and uh, attach them to uh, a steel rod. Uh, so that was that was a little bit of a challenge, and uh, also we had to show, you know, what we were going to do after construction and removing of them and grouting the holes and that kind of thing. So lots of details were needed. For sure. And I'm I'm I was I'm always happy to see redundant sensor systems on a project. I think it's very uh, critical. Uh, it's hard to make any kind of decisions as far as shutting down a site or uh, stopping work if you don't have corroborating evidence. Um, so I, I always highly recommend that. On this, on this site, were you uh, able to compare the data that you were getting from the AMTS to what you were seeing on uh, the settlement sensors or were you kind of combining that or looking at that data together? Yeah. Um... Our teaming partner, WJE, is responsible for the reporting. Uh, of course, we're involved in the day-to-day uh, -day checking of the, uh, of the data and helping to uh, explain uh, what's happening with the data. And uh, Rich is comparing that to uh, settlement monitors and vibration monitors. Uh, and in addition, we're also doing periodic monitoring to make sure that um, other parts of the building aren't moving either. So we're checking that every two weeks. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, uh, Cheryl. Um, you guys are out there, you've got the two total stations measuring, um, I don't know, 40 or so prisms inside the horseshoe, but then you have uh, prisms mounted on the outside of the building, uh, outside the horseshoe that you are monitoring just manually and you're importing that data and displaying it right on the same map. So, and, that, and you can see the graphs and stuff like that. You can analyze it right along with the um, data that's automatically collected. I thought that was a, a, a good application. Uh, I'm, let's, we can move on to the logistics installation. Mm -hmm. When you guys were installing it, um, you guys had contractor support, right? They were they were doing they built the instrument mounts and things like that for you. Yes, they uh, they did a lot of the um, a lot of the installation of the uh, total stations, the 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 wooden platforms that you saw, and also they uh, poured some concrete pillars for. Uh, some of our periodic data is also being monitored from something that could be used as a uh, ATS. So we chose some locations that were uh, uh, strategically placed. So it's like if if we start to have a problem in part of the building, we could uh, switch an ATS um, to one of those locations. Mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, yeah. install the um, survey control, much of the survey control ourselves, though. And uh, 
installing on the side of the building uh, did require uh, a boom lift. And uh, luckily, we have somebody on our team that's boom lift trained. So that's helpful. Yeah, that is super handy uh, on, on these types of projects. Often the instruments in a location that's difficult to get to uh, and the targets uh, are as well. Um, so it's handy. And then having the right tools going out there, um, having a rotary hammer, things like that to drill into concrete masonry. Uh, I find those are indispensable. Um, and just, just uh, you never know what kind of tools you're going to need. Uh, I always, when, whenever we do an install, whenever we're supporting a customer, I try to bring every tool I have in my toolbox uh, just in case. Um, as far as permissions, we were talking yesterday, you said you had some, uh, you had to go through some hoops just to get permission to install some of these targets. Yeah, even though it's all on university property, uh, there's a lot of different people uh, at UVA that have to weigh in and agree on anything. So uh, very much like our uh, specs, we had to submit exactly where they were going to be and how they were going to be installed. Um, one had to show details and things like that. And that had to be approved by a panel at UVA. Yeah. And then more of the, the other things on site that you need to worry about when you're monitoring, um, Roland mentioned during his presentation, communications and power supply mm -hmm. uh, out there at uh, the Alderman Library, the, the same challenges. Um, the power supply, uh, we it's nice. They did a nice job. Electrician came in, set a uh, an outlet right there. Uh, but how how many times have you had to make calls, Cheryl, to have the power restored to the instrument? Uh, this morning was the last time. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Pretty constant. Uh, it's gotten a little bit better. Um, I know that uh, I, I know that the, the beginning of every day, uh, Skanska has a little safety talk, and uh, you know I know they regularly mention, "Don't touch Jake Ray's power source." <laughs> and uh, but you know people see see that the oh here's something I'll just unplug this. What's it doing anyway? Uh, yeah. so that happens uh, yeah. more often than we like, but Skanska's great at, at stepping in and uh, helping us out on a very regular basis with that. Yeah, I've I've had uh, many issues. I was working on a project out in San Francisco where one of our instruments was plugged into a, uh, a site trailer right next to uh, the, the refrigerator was also plugged into the same outlet and the refrigerator kept tripping the breaker on the outlet. So uh, our instrument kept cutting off. So there was a constant battle um, and they got so fed up with the battle that they just unplugged their in our instrument permanently. Um, so it's just, it's silly. We had a in the fridge in the total station. <laughs> yeah, we had another one plugged into, we were, it was on the roof of a building uh, that was a, a nightclub. So we can only get there starting at about 6 p.m., get in there to do it. So if we had any issues with that instrument, we would have to, uh, go there when the bouncer showed up to open the door and uh, get up on the roof and fix it in the middle of the night. Depending yeah. on that. Um, same with communication. Now, uh, a lot of our instruments are set up uh, with a SIM card and the set top just running cellular. Uh, but uh, on this job, Skanska decided to go with our site-wide Wi-Fi. And um, we set it up. And it's kind of a similar, correct me if I'm wrong, Cheryl, similar situation with the power. Um, the Their access points spread out throughout the building are also plugged into nice convenient outlets and they keep getting unplugged uh, about at the same rate as the instrument uh, itself. About at the same rate. I'm going to charge their phone, right? <laughs> I'm going to charge their phone, right? <laughs> so, yeah, they, uh, they sometimes get unplugged. Uh, or just the Wi-Fi might go out for one reason or another. Uh, so again, my uh, um, my partners at Skanska, uh, Dan Swain and Lisa Witt, are really good and responsive. All I, 
you know, I'll, I'll send them a text on a regular basis and they'll check into that for me. Uh, and if it's a little more complicated than that, then, you know, we'll send the Jake Braden person over to investigate <clears throat> further. And, uh, yeah. you know, we often reach out to Joe. Yeah. Hey, Joe, we've done what we can do. <laughs> Help figure this out, please. You know, I, I get online, I get on their server, get on their uh, set tops uh, remotely and try to figure out which, where is, what's not working. Yeah, we, yeah. Also use, we also are using uh, PepWave device connectors out there on that project to tie the uh, little set top M1, the, the controller for the instrument into the uh, on-site Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. and they, have, they have a great remote interface. So remote management, uh, application or platform so like today when i saw one of drake raiden's instruments was down i could get into that management console and see and tell uh cheryl that yeah it's the the west instrument seems like it's offline so i just need to check power over there and check communication um hey joe i'm just going to pause here for for a couple of questions real quick shoot um so earlier we had one come in where uh, david perez was asking if you can get raw data basically from the instruments, um, you know, get calculated coordinates and different things out of there. So not just those charts. Um, and the answer is yes, you can get, you can get basically anything you need out of it. So if you wanted to get just adjusted coordinates in a CSV sheet, you can set up a report to just push that data via FTP, or you can get an email report with Excel sheets and stuff in there. Uh, he also asked if the total station can track reflectivist targets, so not just prisms. Uh, and the answer is yes and no. So for, for automated systems, because it's, it's, not somebody turning to the same target every time and eyeing in through the eyepiece like what they're aiming at. The reflectivist monitoring is a little bit limited. Uh, so you really end up getting only a, a one dimensional change. So only a change in the EDM distance uh, that you're monitoring because it's never going to be self-centering. Uh, but you can use it for supplemental data. So we don't like to do purely reflectivist projects. Uh, but if you have something like this set up and you wanted to also turn to a, a, a spot on the wall and just measure and make sure you're not getting uh, inward or outward settlement, you could do something like that too. Yeah, that, uh, two other comments on that. Th on this project specifically, um, Trey Braden's partner, WJE, wanted to get the raw coordinates. Mm -hmm. So the raw coordinates are being spit, raw adjusted coordinates are being spit out of um, T4D, Trimble 4D control, mm -hmm. uh, to a file, and then uh, T4D automatically sends that to WJE's FTP site. Perfect. So, uh, that way their engineer could do their own graphs and do their own analysis. Um, the, what was the other, what was the other comment or other question? Reflectivist. Sure. Oh. On here? So DR measurements or anything like that, or is it all through uh, prism data? Yeah, this is all prism data. Okay. Yeah. It's all prism data. We are working, uh, um, testing for a project up in Toronto for reflectless pavement measurement. We're doing some testing here on our, and we've got a demo site on the roof. Um, and we've got a customer that is interested in uh, the specifications on that project. Uh, it's a tunneling project in Toronto, require uh, reflectless pavement measurements out in the street. So we're testing it here with our instrument on the roof uh, just to give them some comfortability that that's going to work. Now, mm -hmm. like Roland says, the uh, it's always going to turn to the same angle uh, and just shoot the distance. So we so if a car is in the way, we can set a breakout limit that if the elevation changes uh, a certain amount or the horizontal distance changes a certain amount, it will ignore that measurement. So uh, you just have to be, you know, just use some reasonable numbers for that. Um, so it's it's working pretty well. The vertical. We're seeing on pavement uh, that's about mm, two to three hundred feet away is probably uh, two to three millimeters. So we're getting pretty good results on that. Perfect. Uh, let's see. So communication. The other thing is control. We we'll wanted to talk about that a little bit. The you know one 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 thing I preach is keep things simple. If you can keep it as simple as possible. You have a fixed instrument location, you have a fixed backside, uh, and you monitor, you just turn and monitor. That's probably gonna be your most stable, most reliable um, type setup. However, that's not always possible. Uh, often you have to install the instrument inside the zone of influence 
like we are here on this project, which then complicates things. Uh, this project was further complicated by the limited sight lines of both instruments. Um, they're turned into the horseshoe and they can only see about maybe 50 degrees outside that building. So we really need to get creative with the control in this um, setup to basically tie both instruments together, use some common control points that were still inside the zone of influence. So they're allowed to move in the adjustment, uh, but they're used basically to tie the two instruments together. And then both instruments could see about four, three to four control points, probably four to five control points outside the zone of influence. So we use the two common control points to tie them together mm -hmm. and then use those basically 10, nine or 10 control points that were on the ground outside the zone of influence to fix it to the site. Uh, now that does uh, cause issues if you have, if you lose control points, uh, if uh, in the, like today, the, enough control points, one instrument was offline, one instrument was, uh, had some of its control points blocked, so it wasn't even collect, couldn't figure out where it was, basically. Right. And that's uh, the least of shooting to the dynamic environment. Like, you need, you always need to fix control somehow to, to make the adjustment. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, and, and Skanska was good to work with. We told them we needed some points, extra points set. So we just uh, actually reinstalled it, just pulled out a pillar from one location and they were kind enough to dig a hole and throw it in another location. <laughs> Perfect. So we set up a prism on that. Um, but that's really the common common point. Uh, common, that's really the, uh, the rule of thumb is try to keep it as simple as possible. The other thing is if you, uh, a lot of monitoring consultants, um, if they're just monitoring and not surveyors, they don't understand how to put a site on the ground and tie it into the site control. Uh, I have to give Drake Braden props on this. It was probably the best control I ever got on any project. It just worked. Um, and that's not often the case. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the other thing, Cheryl, the, uh, the other thing we were doing on this project is because we have all this control and it's a complicated adjustment, we are also measuring our checkpoints. Uh, so we basically learn the control points as monitored points. So after the adjustment's done, we kind of have real-time residuals based on a, a secondary measurement on that that is unconstrained. Um, how did you how did you use that, Cheryl? How did you use that information to, uh, to help help with your customer or your client? Help with your customer or your client. Well, you know, we get a lot of questions about, um, you know, hey, it looks like the data has spiked here, uh, and uh, things that I would normally ignore as a conventional surveyor is like half a hundred. But they would say, well, but everything's moved half a hundred. So why is that? Uh, and so I can, I'll come back and say, oh, well, you know, some, uh, some of our survey control points were blocked. So it uses those survey control points to resection, figure out its position, uh, which is great because the ATS can get bumped. It could move uh, a, a hair one way or another. Um, but that really wasn't enough to answer their questions. Um, so they'd say, well, how do we know that that's how it affected this? So what we can do is we can uh, just do an easy graph and say, okay, this point, our survey control point, which is outside the zone of influence, moved 100 to the east. And this uh, other control point also moved 100 to the east. And you're asking about, um, these other points here that, you know, your question is, why are all the points moving 100 to the east? It's like, well, so our our survey control points uh, as a check, uh, we know they haven't moved and they correlate exactly with the, the number that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a real easy visual that anyone can understand and doesn't take a lot of time to analyze it. Do you mind if we take a look at that graph, Cheryl? I know we, we saw it the other day. It looks, it looks pretty nice. <laughs> now you're putting me on the spot, wrong. Yes. I, gotta find I think I have it somewhere. Let's see. I think I have it yeah. somewhere. I realized the one I sent was actually uh, an elevation change, but yeah. 
Let me, oh, actually, let me, I'll just go to the website. That's a good. Oh, perfect. Good yeah. Point. Give me a show for a second. Yeah. Season data. Yeah, go ahead. Let me, uh, sh let me share my screen, Riley. Perfect. Let's see. You sh should be able to, uh, Joe, if you go under the sharing tab, there should still be an option to choose one of your screens to share. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's see. Kick it off. Let's see. Oh, sweet. Yeah. There we go. We can see you okay. So this is um, basically a live view. You can see, let's see. Let me refresh. These might come turn not red anymore. Turn green. Or other colors. Hey, <laughs> that was the instrument that was off. It was covering this whole side of the building. Um, so under one of the analyses here, set up for show was a graph. Let's control check. Oh man, you guys get pretty in depth at the analysis, huh? <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, they were Draper Aiden's, uh, the Jess was the one that uh, did a lot of these graphs. I showed her, trained her on a few, and, and she went bananas uh, and did all the rest. She did a really good job. Um, so this is just the you can see a different control point. These are checkpoints on it. So check in 806 from one instrument. Uh, so and then this should be temperature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that brings up another good point. We always graph temperature over any structural monitoring uh, analysis just to show the correlation between temperature and uh, your building movement, because that yeah. is um, um, that's probably the, the predominant driver of movement in a structure is temperature. Yeah, um, that's pretty different across all projects. We see that everywhere. Where, where the biggest thing you're seeing yeah. is that neural effect from things just expanding and contracting throughout the day. And so yeah. if you only set it up the first week, people are always like, why is it moving two millimeters, you know, from noon to three? It's like, well, yeah, this is getting hotter. Exactly. <laughs> now, all these all these um, measurements are compensated for temperature and pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, the instrument itself has a pr uh, pressure transducer in it. Yep. Uh, the temperature uh, probe is actually part of the set-top controller, and it's a separate probe because the temperature inside the instrument is always elevated over ambient so there's a probe that we usually stick outside the bottom of the enclosure that uh, logs temperature and all that all those those values are brought in and used to compensate every single measurement it's actually logged uh, the temperature and pressure are logged on every line inside the raw gka file um, so this is just a graph that shows you you see some at this point here the control uh, was getting mixed there was issues with the control, and then we had three hundreds. Now we can set tolerances inside T4D to if the adjustment doesn't work, we can uh, just reject it. So if we exceed certain limits on your uh, quality of the adjustment, you can just reject it. We can send warnings, alarms, and also just reject it. Um, but this is one of the graphs that uh, on the uh, control point checkpoints. Mm -hmm that was used in a horizontal and a vertical, vertical one. Joe, would you mind showing that uh, custom view one more time too, that view of the horseshoe with the targets there? Sure. I know there's, the, there's a good anecdote about some of the displacements on there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one, um, actually I have to click on it. Um, so this um, this block column right here was the problem child in the beginning. Uh, they started working on this foundation. They're underpinning all this. So they're working on this foundation. And this column started to move. And it was right in the very beginning of the project. Um, and so everybody was questioning, is that really movement, blah, blah, blah. But we could prove, we could show them that, you know, the other ones weren't moving. You know, we got. 2000s here, uh, you know, all these other columns weren't moving. And so it was very early in the project. And you could show, you could see this graph, you could see the trend, the trend was evident. Uh, it was moving, you know, about half, half a hundredth a day. And it was also with settlement as well. So the, it was not only kicking out into the excavation, but it was settling. So you could 
uh, see what was happening. And they finally caught it. They, they finally stabilized it. And um, it, but this was the one that was causing the consternation over a 32nd of an inch because it was a 32nd of an inch underneath the threshold to shut the job down. So bouncing back and forth. Yep. And uh, so that's why it became all of a sudden a critical issue. The, the superintendent backed into one of the control points uh, and <laughs> knocked it just enough to change the whole adjustment by a 32nd of an inch. And it became my job to chase that down and try to figure out what it was, relearn that point in its new location and then fix the, uh, get it back to where it was. And, you know, we're talking about a jump of a 32nd of an inch on a, on a graph. Yeah, it can be critical sometimes. And you can also see this are some of the manual monitoring points that Draper Aiden has, uh, has started incorporating into the graph. So this is a good visual of how you can incorporate manual monitoring points uh, along with your automated points. All the ones that point, you have somebody going with their total station and setting up independently, right? And then shooting them and uploading them into T4D. Yeah, that's a question for Cheryl. I think she said once a week, right? Uh, it's it's actually supposed to be every two weeks. Uh, had a had an issue with our data collector, so uh, we're we're a little bit overdue, but we're out there monitoring uh, right now, actually. So, uh, but yeah, basically every two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, so they just uh, take those coordinates, adjust the coordinates, then import them, make sure they have the right IDs, um, and then import them right here in, the, in the, the website. And it updates all the graphs. They can get all the same kind of graphs on these that they do on the automated points. Is that changes to? See how long, see how long you've been doing this one. Yeah. Oh, sweet, yeah. 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 So same type of graphs that uh, you can see. You can, these graphs are all editable. Mm -hmm. You can turn things on and off. The analyses are where you have uh, regressions and things like that you can do to, uh, to spot trends. Um, okay, we're getting close on time. Let's see. Yeah, I think we just had uh, one more question come in, which is kind of to do with the accounting and project management. Mm -hmm. And so, this is a web page. You can publish it to a public URL, uh, and because it's it's accessible via the internet, we want everything to be kind of locked behind some security. Um, so, anybody that has access to the system gets set up with an account that is bespoke to them. It's their email address with a custom password. Uh, you can also set all sorts of different access levels there. And so a lot of people are just going to have kind of read-only access to this where they just come in and see the charts and receive reports. And then you can have some key people be analysts or admins on the uh, project. And you can also have multiple project sites run through a single instance of T4D. So if Skanska was running this Alderman site and another site at UVA, you could split it into two places. And then just people working on one side or the other can receive reports and emails that are you know only relevant to them, so not seeing uh, multiple data sets they don't care about. So things can be very uh, customizable that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there is um, there is an IT component to this. So if you're going to yep. tackle um, tackle a an automated monitoring project, we um, you're going to be installing. You probably want to dedicate a server to it. Yep. Uh, you're going to be running Microsoft SQL Server. Um, we typically most most of our customers are now running it in Azure. Microsoft mm -hmm. Azure is fully Azure compatible. Uh, this one, Draper Aiden's IT department is very good, very proactive, very responsive. Um, they are the one, most customers I can, you know, they'll let me get into their server and, and kind of have a user ID and, and log in. Draper Aiden um, is very uh, uh, security conscious for a good reason. And so all I do is I send them a go to assist link and I haven't waited more than five minutes to get into their server to troubleshoot something. So their their IT department is great, but you may have to uh, involve your, if you have an IT department, involve them. We 
uh, met with their IT department, did an online meeting uh, probably a month before the project was scheduled to start so yep. that we could install the software, uh, show them all the different items that they'd have to, to set up, a security certificate, set up a, a dedicated email address to be able to send out your alerts and alarms and your invitations to join the project and have access to the project, so to receive your credentials. Um, so you do have to deal with that. But that being said, we other have another customer, you might even be on here, Bruce, I'm talking to you, that ran on a doorstep, a, a doorstop laptop on his credenza. Um, so, um, it, it, you know, you don't need a whole ton of IT, um, you know, you, you don't uh, have to have a, a very sophisticated IT, but you do have to run those components. Um, For sure. And we also, the other thing here at Duncan Parnell, we offer our customers data hosting. So if you don't want to, to be responsible for running that or, or don't have the in-house technology, uh, in-house capability to run a server, run something in the cloud, you know, we can certainly do that for you. We just charge you a monthly fee, fee to boot up all that infrastructure. We, we do it for you in Azure uh, and set up a completely separate Azure account and infrastructure dedicated to your project. So we've had the people taking advantage of that are usually the people that don't have any IT support and the companies that have giant IT department centers, very security conscious. They don't want to have anything to do with running a, a web server inside their infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, so we, with those, they fall into those two categories. Um, so talk a little bit about websites and setting up the stuff. Uh, reporting and alarming. Uh, last, operation and maintenance. Uh, just because this is automated does not mean in any way that this is maintenance free. And you can see just by speaking about this project today that you know it does require maintenance. You have to go out and troubleshoot things sometimes. Something doesn't work. Um, you know, we had again. I'm going to pick on Bruce Flora. His instrument kept losing orientation, and uh, it's really just the, you know, I kept telling him the tribrax moving, tribrax moving. Um, it was just his, his mount was just a little rough, and the tribrax was catching on a piece of gravel, and it was kind of top of concrete. So um, once we straightened that out, it was all good. But it's just, it takes maintenance. you got to yep. go out there and clean prisms. You have to unblock prisms, move things that get in the way. Um, and we're talking a lot of today, mostly about uh, total stations, because that's what we're running on this, what three grades are on this project. So there are other options that we, the geotechnical sensors and GNSS that we really didn't talk about today. But uh, for total stations, they do require line of sight maintenance, um, cleaning the prisms, and that type of thing. Yeah. Troubleshooting communications and power and all that stuff. Yeah, and any site is going to have its own challenges. Uh, it's not to say it's, it's anything impossible. It's just uh, just kind of the cost of doing business. Like you always have to be aware of things that can change on site, and when they do, you just got to take action for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The prisms, L-bar prisms make great co hooks. You know, when it gets cold, everybody's hanging their jacket on the prism. Uh, <laughs> um, is there anything else? I think that's all I really had. Uh, Cheryl, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Oh, I, just one thing about the periodic monitoring is uh, there's an app that you can use, which is uh, really helpful. It uh, allows you to collect the data much more quickly, and especially if you've got really steep angles like we have and especially we'll have in uh, courtyard monitoring um, it it would be really difficult to uh, you know even with the angled eyepiece to see exactly what you're doing you need to double those angles so uh, it uh, it's great for that application for sure and you're talking about triple access monitor yeah perfect so yeah just a little more info on that. Triple Access is is the uh, software package that we use for um, field data collection of the total station. 
and there's a monitoring module on there. So you measure your prisms one time, uh, save it as a project, and the next time you go to the site to set up, you can just tell it measure around, and it'll just turn to the prisms and measure them for you. So it can save you a bunch of time when you're on site, especially if it's hard to look through the total station. So, all right. Well, I think we're out of time. So I, I appreciate everybody uh, that participated in this. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Roland. Yeah, thank uh, you guys thank you so much. Yeah, and then everybody that uh, that watched it, I uh, hope you enjoyed. I hope you got something out of it. But um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at Duncan Parnell. Uh, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to Trimble's monitoring support. Their support team uh, that's dedicated to the monitoring products is fantastic. Um, and again, probably less than an hour response time on any question. I don't want to set a standard that you can't meet, Roland, but uh, <laughs> that's my experience, really, honestly. Yeah, we take a lot of pride in our support, so feel free to reach out anytime. So yeah, any, if you need anything, give us a shout. So thanks for attending, and uh, everybody have a great day. Yeah, thanks everybody.